So this video is about why I believe. Why do I believe in God? Why do I believe in Jesus Christ? Why do I believe that Christianity is the ultimate reality? It's in some ways an answer to... I mean, I, I've watched videos online of atheists where, where they don't believe. They don't believe in Jesus, or they don't believe in God, or they don't believe in this, or they don't believe in that. And this video is in some ways my response to that, as well as to other people. Other people who I've seen who maybe believe in God, but don't believe in Jesus, or believe in this, and don't believe in that, or just whatever. Whatever. Whatever it is. Um... Because I want to get my own thoughts across. And my own thoughts are peculiar, and they're very particular to myself. Um, ultimately, what it comes down to, if I had to say why it is that I believe in God, why it is that I believe in God as the Father of Jesus Christ, that... Christianity is the ultimate reality, it comes down to my great-granduncle, who is the man pictured on the left here, the Archbishop of Canton, Dominic Tang Yiming, who was not only an archbishop, but someone who suffered for the faith. He was imprisoned by the Chinese Communist government for 22 years and nine months. And he survived. I mean, he survived, and I don't think you can say that of anyone else. I, I don't think that there's any story like that. I don't think that there's anyone of any other faith who has been in prison or in jail or suffered that much and survived. Survived in the same sense that he did. I, I've never heard that story. I've never heard it told. It, it's only Christians. Only Christians have that kind of a story. Only Christians have undergone extreme persecution and survived and thrived. I mean, in the case of my great-granduncle, there's 22 years, 10 months, seven of those years he was in solitary confinement. I mean, they did everything they could to break him, and he didn't break. He just didn't break psychologically. He was able to survive seven years of solitary. And that's a long time. I mean, to put that in perspective, that's longer than the entirety of World War II. Like, that's longer... Than, than all of it. All of it. And it's like, that's a long period of time. I don't think that the average person even can wrap their head around it. And, it, and it's not just jail time either. It's communist jail time in China. It's jail time where they're constantly working on trying to break someone psychologically, trying to destroy them, to grind them down through political manipulation, through mental manipulation, trying to destroy someone, and they couldn't. Everything they did failed. And he, he saw everything. I mean, he saw the very priests he trained die in front of him in prison, in the labor camp. And he persevered. He kept going. And it isn't just that he survived. It's that when he got out, he still had his brain. He was still sane enough to write an autobiography. And not just an autobiography, but an autobiography recounting his experiences and forgiving his captors, forgiving the people who put him through 22 years in prison.
I, I just, no one else has been through that kind of a thing, and it's an amazing story. What's even crazier or more incredible is that the guy pictured on the right, uh, Cardinal Ignatius Kung, was in a communist prison for 30 years! 30 years! Three decades! I mean, it's, it's incredible. It's insane. It's so long. It's difficult. It's difficult to understand how long that is. That's, I mean, 30 years is a generation. It is, for some people, a lifetime that he was in prison. And it's like, and they're not, and I mean, they're in prison because they were preaching the faith. It wasn't like they'd killed anyone. They hadn't. All they were doing was just celebrating the faith and refusing to bow down to a totalitarian regime. And, I mean, that's, looking at these stories and thinking about it, I mean, part of the reason, I guess, that people can still be atheists is because, I guess, they don't have to confront these things. I mean, ultimately, there's very few sources online that talk about Cardinal Ignatius Kung, and there's nothing. There is basically nothing that talks about Archbishop Dominic Tang. I mean, when I made a video about my great-granduncle, it, it was, I think, one of the first videos on YouTube about him. Uh, now, part of the reason is, is that his story is being blocked. He wrote an, uh, his autobiography, and it's been printed, but you, you can't get it. For whatever reason, you can't get it. It's not in print. I don't know why. I don't know who owns it. I'd like to get it. I'd like to read it, but for right now, it, it's uh, not possible yet. But, I mean, just thinking about atheism, I, I, it's, it's strange. I mean, I would say, what I would say is honestly, even if I didn't believe, then I think I would still try to be a Christian. That, that is my thinking. Because it's, it's like all these things, these things are documented. It's documented that these people did what they did, that they were in prison, that they withstood multiple decades of the most intense pressure, the most intense psychological grinding that anyone has withstood and survived, and survived with their minds intact. And it's like, if even if I didn't believe, then I, I think looking at the evidence, I would be forced to try to believe, or at the very least to try to emulate people who believed. Because it, it's like, How should I put this? Even if I was an atheist, I think I would, I would have to become a Christian. Because even if I didn't believe in God, there would be so much evidence that following a Christian life develops not only virtue, but perseverance to survive basically anything. Like, just anything that realistically the modern world can throw at you and survive with your mind intact. And it's like, okay, that this is basically the only religion that can allow you to do that, or the only, or the only belief system that can allow that. Then it's like, yeah, that's, 
I mean, why wouldn't you go with that? It, it's like, even if you didn't believe in God, why would you not go with what is basically the best system? The most robust system? Like, why would you settle for anything inferior to that? Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. But... That, that is the thing. I mean, so many of these things... I mean, part of it is just the story itself, that... Even within the Catholic Church, the story of... Persecution within, within China, Communist China, is not completely known. Uh, and the main reason for that, uh, I mean, the main reason for that is that there, there's still ongoing persecution, but also there, there's a language barrier. Uh, fundamentally, a lot of the people uh, who were persecuted, their, their families that survived them don't necessarily um, speak English. And then even the, even the people who do they might not necessarily have the greatest of faith. But if I had to say fundamentally, it's like, why, why do I believe in God? Why do I believe in Jesus? I, I suppose this is why. And it's, it's a very singular thing for me. I mean, it's, it's within my family. It's not, it isn't something that is, it isn't something that is necessarily something I can share with other people, where I can just say, oh, you know, this is the story, and this is how it is. It's like, no, for me, the story of my great grand uncle is the story of my, of a blood relation. He he isn't just some nebulous figure. He is the brother of my great grandfather. And I know that to a certain extent there is a bond that is very deep. Um that exists between, uh, between him and between the, um, that branch of the family that survives him, that lives on and, and is currently living on the earth. And so that's why, you know, sometimes I think about it and it's like, you know, I can tell someone this thing, but it's like, it won't ever register in the same way. It, it won't ever... If they're not family, it's like it doesn't... It doesn't quite hit home. But yeah, I mean, I, I would say fundamentally that's, that's, if I had to go down to, like, core belief, absolute bedrock, that's basically what I would say is, is there. And I mean, it's all, it's historically documented. It, it happened, you know, within the last, um within the last hundred years. So, I mean, the persecution is beyond dispute, I guess. Now, if, if I was going to make an argument to someone, I guess, to make an argument, you know, based on... based on something that's more like a miraculous event, um, then I would make the argument based on Our Lady of Fatima. Uh, that's fundamentally... If I had to choose one event 
one event within salvation history where it's like, I guess, like a key event, a key event that, like, you can look at it and you can try to... How should I put this? One key event to, to focus on and to study in detail, this would be it. Now you might be saying, you know, why? Why, why this, particular, uh, this particular event? The main reason would be the miracle of the sun. Uh, that, that event had so many witnesses, was so extensive so unusual, so different than normal experience and miraculous in a way that, that I don't think people have seen or, or understand even. I do think that, that it is something, it's like if people want If people require miracles in order to believe, I, I would say more so than anything else that has more so than most other miracles, I, I would say that that is the one. Also because it, it's fairly recent. Because it's so recent, it's well documented. I mean, it, it is one of the most well documented miracles that have ever happened. Just ever. It's a miracle that existed when press reporters and, and people, skeptical people, very skeptical pe people came there uh, because they were told there's going to be a miracle. And that's also another unusual thing, that they were told in advance there would be a miracle, and there was a miracle. That does not happen, usually, even in salvation history. That people are told beforehand that there will be a miracle, there will be a, an event. But it did happen on that occasion. And that's pretty crucial. I mean, the other bit is that everything that Mary said at the event, which has happened, has happened. What I mean by that is that everything she said which pertains to events which were in the future from the event, but are in the past from our perspective, everything that she prophesied would take place before our time has happened and took place exactly as she described. And so that, that's kind of a big deal. I mean, that, 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 that's how it took place. That it, it did, you know, someone who doesn't believe then needs to, to come up with, with an answer for, for the obvious question. It's like, okay, you have a woman here who looks like Mary and is saying things, is prophesying. All the prophecies turn out to be true. Not just true, but true exactly as she said them to be. And it's like, I don't think... And these things are all recorded. I mean, there's things she described. For example... That, that there would be another war, and that before the war there would be a great light. And there was a great light. Before the next war, there was an aurora borealis. There was a great light. Not only a great light, but it was a great light in the northern hemisphere, which covered exactly the places that would be the major scenes of combat in World War II. And it's, it's like when you examine these things in detail, everything is laid out. And it's like there's no, 
I mean, it, it's, for me, it's, it's like, I don't even know how an atheist can, can wrap their minds around that, because it's like, how else, how, how can you explain, you know, I mean, someone would want to say, oh, well, they just made it up. It's like, no, they didn't. They didn't just make it up. Because if they made it up, how did everything they make up turn out to be true? That doesn't make sense. And that isn't how these things work. It, it would be harder, harder for it to, for these events to have happened. And it's so well documented. I mean, that's the thing. It's like, it's so well documented. All the things that were prophesied. All the things that were written down. But, I mean, there's still, I guess, there's always going to be people who don't believe. You know, and I guess... I mean, for me, as a historian, finding that everything she said was true in a historical sense, for me, that was what I needed to believe. That was what I needed to believe specifically in the Catholic Church as the primary manifestation of Christianity, as, as the primary church. Because from the story of, of my great-granduncle, it's a Christian story. I mean, it's not to say, you know, it's not to say that him being an archbishop is meaningless to me, but I do feel that from his story that it's it's a universal story for all Christians. I, I think whether Catholic, Protestant, or Orthodox, you can look at the story of my great-granduncle and see in him the same story as the early Christian martyrs. It, it is proof positive that Christianity is the religion. But Our Lady of Fatima is very specific. It is very specific to the Catholic Church. Now, you know, I don't know enough about every Protestant denomination to say what their views are on Our Lady of Fatima. Um, you know, that might be something interesting to explore in the future, to see what their thoughts are. Um, and I have seen things from... Um, from Russian Orthodox, from one Russian Orthodox priest, I think it was, talking about Fatima, and his thoughts on the subject. He had some interesting thoughts on the subject, actually, uh, but mainly he accepted that it, it, it must be Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ, that, that it couldn't be anyone else but her, that that was the only explanation in his mind. I think in the future I, I will try to go into these things in detail, but I mean, I, I guess the main point of this video is, is to try to get things off my chest, to get my point across, because it's, it's frustrating and it's, it's difficult for me to think about these things as an individual. Normally, when I think about things... I almost try to imagine, like, having a conversation with someone else about things, and it's difficult to, like, think up in my mind about how things go, 
But then it's also like, I don't even know who I would be able to talk to about this. Like, because if I talk to someone who just doesn't know anything, it's like the whole conversation would be just me, like, explaining the basics of the faith. Um, where it's like, it's so basic, it's like we couldn't ever really get into anything serious. Where it's like, oh, you know, this is a rosary. This is a prayer. Like, I'm not saying that that's not worthwhile for its own sake, but it's not, it's not the higher level things which I think are interesting, like truly interesting about, about the faith. Because, like, for me, as a historian, it was studying salvation history by which, uh, while also praying the rosary, that I began to have a better and better understanding of just how things work. And the more I think about it, the more I think it's like, if you don't know history, if you don't know what happened before, if you don't know huge sections of the story, you're not going to get it. Like, you're not going to understand there's so much you are going to miss that it, I mean, I'm not saying that it's like you're, you have nothing, but it's like if you don't have the history, you, you have less than half the story at, at least. Like, it's, it's incredible, the advantages that a, a historical, a historical background and a detailed study of history, uh, bring to the table in terms of just understanding what the faith is, what's going on, how to interpret things. And there's different sections of it. Like, it's not just... It's not just understanding... You know, for Protestants, a lot of their understanding of salvation history is, is Old Testament, New Testament. And so, they have an understanding of the Scripture, but they don't have an understanding of how that actually relates um, going into the present. They don't have an understanding, really, of salvation history uh, over the course of the last uh, roughly 1,900 years or so. Or, it, I mean, basically, it's, it's like it doesn't, And part of that is because they've made a rejection of that. They have made a rejection of many, uh, many of the traditions. But... You know, if I had to say it, I would say that history is important. History is important. And it's important in a way that, that might not necessarily be obvious right now. And history, it, it's essential because, you know, the point of studying history, I mean, there, there is a value in studying history for its own sake, but the main reason you study history, you look at history, part of the main reason is that you're going to have to go into the future. And there's things in the future that if you don't know what happened before, you're not going to understand what's going on. You're not going to understand what the future looks like. Because a lot of things are going to happen in the future. 
there's going to be a lot of things. And it's like, you need to see what happened in the past in order to understand, or to even begin to understand, what's going to happen in the future, and to understand how people... I mean, how prophecy works, how people, they've had visions of the future, but what those visions mean, how, how is it going to work out, what, what, do, what do all of the things that someone saw mean? It's like, they, the meaning, you do need to have a historical sense in order to build up a vocabulary of symbolism so that when you see things you can begin to understand what it is you're looking at because uh, otherwise you you won't know you won't know what it is you're looking at you won't know what it is you're reading you won't know where you're going and Yeah, I mean, symbols, symbols are important. They're essential. I mean, there's so many things, so many things about the faith that are high level, difficult to understand, but are incredibly rewarding once you begin to grasp them. And I and I don't say understand them, because really, a lot of these things, you're not going to actually fully comprehend what it is you're looking at until you get to heaven. Like, until you're actually somewhere... It's hard to explain exactly what it is these things mean. But you can begin to understand. And it's difficult. It's difficult. And some of these things, it's like, they can't necessarily even be explained. To a certain extent, you have to rely on working with people where, where they've put effort in. they put effort in, they've been praying, they've been studying the gospel, they've been doing work beforehand, before they look at this thing. And it's like, if people haven't done that, what are they going to know? Are they going to know anything? Or are they just going to look at something and, and not understand it? I mean, it's, it is challenging, it is challenging working with people who have, it is challenging working with people who have a lower level of knowledge, or a lower level of understanding, um, and in particular people who have a lower level of understanding, and And don't have the humility to, to admit that they have a lower level of understanding. Don't have the humility to say, I need to set aside what it is that I think I know, and I need to work on this thing in order to begin to understand it. And it's frustrating. It's incredibly frustrating. But, I mean, that's, it's, it is part of the faith. And to a certain extent, it's like, things do become rewarding. Like, incredibly rewarding. Um, as understanding is achieved. 
I mean, it, it is, the harder something is, the more rewarding it is when, when, yeah, I guess you've, uh, you've accomplished something. But, I mean, ultimately, I do try to stay grounded in, in terms of staying on track in the real world. I mean, I don't, I don't usually do too much online. My videos, I mean, I don't even think about what it is I'm filming when I'm out on a bike. I mean, I'm just going for it. I'm going for the ride, going from church to church, mission to mission, and just trying to find the best route, the route that I think is going to be the most efficient, the safest, the clearest, the one where people are going to travel it and not get lost. And, you know, I'm just hoping that as clean as, and as clear as I can make it, that I can create a path that is something that St. Junipero Serra would look at and say, yeah, that's... You did all right. And, uh, I mean, sometimes I think that's, uh, that's the best way to do it. But, uh, yeah, I guess I just wanted to get those, uh, get those thoughts together and uh, talk to you guys later.